Welcome to the World Affairs Council of the Monterey Bay Area. We hope you enjoy the following quick take on international affairs while we all wait out the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Hello, my name is Professor Bradley J. Strasser. I'm a philosophy professor here at the Naval Postgraduate School, a proud member of the Defense Analysis Department. I believe I'm the only philosopher, uh, at least by disciplinary training <laughs> at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, as a philosopher, I, I write broadly across a lot of sub areas of philosophy, but my main work focuses on ethics and specifically, I've written a great deal and, and researched a great deal on the ethics of warfare, both the history of just war theory or the just war tradition, as well as some really complicated new emerging understandings and conceptions of the just war tradition as it applies to the modern military environment and modern warfare. Uh, the ethics of war is obviously a pretty huge topic. Uh, I'm not gonna get into all that today, but as part of this quick take series for the World Affairs Council, who I'd like to thank for inviting me to, to share a quick take, I wanna explore a few issues around the ethics of war uh, in our modern era as it relates to the history of the ethics of war and how technology has uh, intersected those two and how technology has shifted and changed in some ways our ability to behave ethically in warfare and some other uh, interesting corollary results. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today and uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining me on this talk. Let me go ahead and pull up a, a couple slides here to give us some guidance. So the ethics of warfare and changing technology. Uh, the ethics of war is a complicated matter, like I say, traditionally divided uh, into the just war theory rubric of what's known as jus ad bellum, the moral questions around why or when we're justified to go to war and what's known as use in bellow, those moral questions surrounding the moral behavior within war that we believe is justifiable. There's actually several other use type uh, derivations that have come out uh, since that we've developed some more principles on like uh, use post bellum, uh, interesting work lately on use ex bellow, when is it morally right to end a war amongst many others. But today I'm gonna focus specifically on a very uh, key part of the ethics of warfare, and that's how we understand the death of civilians in war. Classically, of course, in just war theory, we believe that civilian death is to be avoided uh, at all costs, often, and in fact that there's a key principle to protecting civilians in war, that they should be immune from harm. We'll get to that in a minute, but I'm going to specifically look at how civilian death in war has, has been understood, but also how the actual realities of civilian death in war has changed over time in human history, and especially recently, how technology's role in modern warfare has shaped that arc in some significant ways, both bad, unfortunately, but also potentially a silver lining of some good uh, in recent years. So I want to begin with the ancient principle of just war known as distinction. Uh, sometimes this is known as discrimination. And this is simply the classic idea that with a, with across a, a population set on both sides of a conflict, that are around and involved in war, that we can make a distinction between those active, uh, those people who are actively fighting and engaging and waging war against one another. Uh, traditionally, this is a thought of as posing a threat uh, or actually taking up arms or in some way actively engaging in the ability to wage war that either side brings versus everyone else. Uh, classically, we call the former combatants and the latter non-combatants or civilians. This is not a new principle. This has been around a long time. In fact, the just war tradition itself is ancient. The idea that there are right and wrong ways to fight, fight war and that there are right and wrong ways morally to even reasons to even go to war. But that's not new. It's been around across multiple cultures for thousands of years. Uh, in the Western canon, it's traditionally finds its locus starting in uh, Augustine, St. Augustine, the philosopher and theologian of the early church era and the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, but from there, you can just trace this long history of thinkers. Uh, and you can also find really important insights and additions to the classic understanding of just war theory from other cultures as well. So this is not a new idea. But one of the earliest thoughts of the just war tradition was that civilians should be protected from harm. The civilians are different than combatants, and we should treat them different, more, differently morally in war. Uh, the idea is that you, you might want to start from the positive side, which is that who is liable to be killed? Who is liable to be harmed? And the view is that combatants are liable to be harmed. Or in other words, we're asking the question, who should die and who should not die? With the key emphasis here on the word should. Uh, in fact, I can't help but give a shameless plug. I wrote a small book on this uh, called Who Should Die? Convenient title. 
what we mean here by liable is not a legal sense liable, of course. We mean morally liable. It's a technical term of art in the field of just work theory. And it means simply that morally it is correct that in some sense, the individuals who are targeted for death combatants to be harmed in war, it is in a sense correct to target them to be killed and not others. Now that's controversial, but that is the long tradition uh, in warfare. The corollary, of course, is simple, that non-combatants, everyone else, are immune from harm, that they should not be targeted for death or harm in war, uh, if at all possible, uh, it, especially intentionally, which we'll get to in a minute. This picture here is a, is a profound one making this point. Uh, at different times in history, this principle has been understood and upheld in different ways and to different extremes and across different cultures. Uh, it's been all over the place, but this is a nice example here from certain times, especially in the 19th century, when we saw staged kind of battles out on a battlefield by large standing armies, think of the Civil War, think of the Napoleonic Wars, where the battles were actually intentionally fought outside of the city, out on literally the battlefield for this purpose. Like that's where the battle happens and it shouldn't impact others to such an extent that civilians would maybe even come and picnic and watch the battle <laughs> from afar. A pretty wild idea today but an example of the non-combatant immunity principle in action. It's not just that they should not be targeted, it's that actually civilians traditionally should be shielded from harm, that, that soldiers, combatants who are engaged in warfare should go out of their way to give actual protection to civilians of both sides, interestingly, across a, con a conflict. The idea is that com non-combatants on both sides are completely non-liable, even as combatants on both sides are equally liable. Of course, there's always countless exceptions and war crimes have occurred. And what I mean by war crime here is the distinction between a civilian dying in war versus a civilian intentionally being targeted for harm. That is the key difference. This is a rather gruesome picture here. I apologize, it's a tragic shot of a, of a small child killed in war. But the question of course, when you look at this is, is you wonder was, was the child killed intentionally? Did the, did the combatants on either side of a conflict drop a bomb or a munition that was designed with the purpose of killing this child, or was it what we call collateral damage? It's a bit of a euphemism I try not to use. I just try to say unintentional death, unintentional harm. But the idea of collateral damage is that as long as the target or the goal of the operation or the military tactic wasn't to kill civilians, the thought is that there is a different way of understanding that kind of harm, that it is, it is awful and we want to avoid it but it is different in kind from intentional harming of civilians, which is what we'd categorize as a war crime. This has a long pedigree. Uh, it goes way back. I think it's worth it here just to take a quick mention of, of the history of this. This, uh, this gentleman here is Thomas Aquinas, if you don't know, and it comes out of the Thomistic tradition, what's known as the doctrine of double effect. And what August, no, I'm sorry, what Aquinas here was trying to understand was simply a, a kind of a philosophical puzzle of if you have an action that results in multiple effects, at least two, and one of those effects is a good effect. It's, it's a morally uh, positive thing in the world that we want to have happen. But another effect of this same action will be bad. Is it justifiable to do that act? If you can actually foresee and know that that double or secondary effect, that side effect will occur. Well, Aquinas tried to lay out kind of a, a test, a series of rules. And this is, uh, forgive me for those of you that know this so well, but the doctrine of double effect is simple. It says, listen, first, for any action, you have to decide what's the main effect here I'm trying to accomplish, and is that good? Hopefully the answer to that is yes. The second rule is that this kind of second effect, this side effect, you can foresee it, you can know it's coming, but you can't intend it. And this is the test he's asking in order for it to be justified action. If you intend that bad effect, then it's not justifiable. The third rule is that the secondary effect also can't be the means to the good effect. And lastly, the good effect must ultimately outweigh the bad. So if we foresee, for example, that there might be collateral harm, in other words, a side effect that would kill civilians, but it's not intentional and it's, and it's foreseen, but it's not the goal of the operation. And we'll talk about how you can test for that in a minute. And it's not the means to actually accomplishing the good effect. Then you have to ask kind of this consequentialist question. Is it worth it? Is the harm, this, this bad, worth the good? So presumably the good has to be very significant, very important, some critical mission, some critical operation that we need to do to, to win the war something like that. So this is this basic idea that civilians are protected from harm. It's a very classic idea and it's, a, it's ancient. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that civilians, of course, are always protected from harm. Sometimes they are intentionally killed, which is awful. But other times, civilians might die through unintentional harm. Uh, and sometimes we think that might be justifiable on the classic just war tradition. Okay, so across the, the whole arc of history then, we, we see that this principle persists. Uh, it, 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 this is just in the Western canon. You see it come up originally through Augustine, through Aquinas, through Grotius, all the way through the contemporary writers, people like Michael Walter, of course, as the most recent uh, kingpin of just war theory tradition, but it, even into the more modern revisionist just war theorists like mm -hmm. Jeff McMahon or many others. But here's where things changed. That's all sort of the preamble. You've got this basic idea of just war theory. You have this basic idea of protecting civilians. And then comes along modern warfare. Now, I don't mean to suggest that different technological changes in military history did not also have an impact on this arc of civilian protection and warfare. And they certainly did. I also don't mean to suggest for a second that different eras and different times didn't have awful civilian casualties. And in fact, in many eras and some cultures, civilian death was a given on purpose. You would win the war and then you'd go and slaughter the men and enslave the children and women. So that's, I'm not trying to suggest that. I'm trying to suggest the overall trend actually an arc of civilian protection and war was improving steadily and was understood as a norm until some significant changes in the 20th century technology uh, of warfare changed. Specifically, I'm thinking of the mechanization that occurred in World War I and World War II and beyond, and of course the advent of aerial, uh, of air power of aerial bombardment. So military technology changed in a lot of ways in the 20th century. It changed obviously with the ability to do incredible amounts of damage to a large population group simply by flying over them and dropping munitions. But it's also that the tactics themselves changed. There's an interesting question here on which led which. And I think this is a case where the technology really changed the policy and the technology sort of led the ethics, not the other way around. What I mean by the tactics change is that it's very hard to argue, for example, this is a famous shot of, of the results of the firebombing in Dresden. It's very hard to argue when you're doing widespread carpet bombing of civilian cities that you didn't intend civilian death, but that was a side effect to your military operation. Rather, the tactics themselves, enabled by the technology, seem to actually start targeting civilians. Or if it wasn't intentional, it might be a distinction without a difference. Uh, the result of all of this is, was devastating for non-combatants. Right? Non-combatant harm and death and warfare as a percentage of the kind of harm and death that happens in warfare in the total has actually steadily gone up uh, as this technological revolution happened over the past hundred years. Uh, here's an interesting statistic for you. Civilian fatalities in warfare actually climbed from about 5% at the turn of the century, which is shocking. And the turn of the century, this is the last century, this is at yeah, uh, the turn to 1900. Um, civilian fatalities were actually incredibly low in, in warfare uh, before the turn of the 1900 century, uh, but they climbed to 15% during World War I and all the way up to 65% of all the deaths in World War II were civilian deaths. To now, in the modern era, most recently, more than 90% uh, of the past uh, few decades wars, 90% of the casualties were actually civilians. And this is a combination of the changing technology and the way that the technology changed tactics. Um, so this is bad. This is a bad situation and it's sad and it's, and it's not an uplifting story. The trend for civilian protection and war, this great principle of distinction of just war theory, uh, looks bleak. And it's a combination of the rise of air power, uh, the, the advancement in more common aspects of urban warfare, population-centric tactics, uh, side effect losses in the extreme. What I mean by that is there were times when there's uh, genuine attempts to target military targets, but because the technology itself was just so damaging but not very accurate or precise, uh, you could argue that the civilian deaths were genuine side effects in the principled kind of traditional doctrine double effect sense, but it almost becomes irrelevant <laughs> because the civilian losses are so high and so extreme and you, they're so foreseeable that whether or not they're unintended becomes, it may, may not be morally irrelevant, but it certainly is irrelevant for those civilians who have died. So this is sad, but this is the big, change here. And this is really kind of the punchline of, of my short quick take today for thinking about world affairs in the age of COVID in this tough year of 2020. Military technology has continued to change. Uh, and most recently, the military techno technological changes, I argue, actually gives us some reason for optimism. What do we have going on? Well, in the past 20 to 30 years, but especially the past 15 years or so, 
we've gotten more and more capable at discrimination through military technology. So this is because weapons are more accurate and precise. This is because weapons actually are able to deliver a smaller yield that's more targeted. The delivery mechanisms themselves are better. Uh, we have better um, reconnaissance and intelligence and surveillance capabilities because of technology, which enables us to be more targeted towards liable combatant harm instead of non-combatant harm. And on and on, and, and several others, including actually some policy changes, more restrictive rules of engagement, at least in most Western militaries. Uh, this actually raises a quick small little aside here. I apologize to take, take a minute. Um, I, I used on the previous slide the, the phrase that our technology has become more accurate and more precise. Some people are confused on this and I've had people push back on this. Uh, there is a difference between accurate uh, accuracy and precision. A lot of people don't know what it is. Here's four examples. Just as a quick test for the viewer here, which one of these do you think is represents accuracy? Which one precision? Which one both? Which one neither? Should be the neither and the both should be pretty clear. But I'll go ahead and tell you, like this first uh, bullseye here, this is accurate, but not precise. In other words, it's, the accuracy is the test of how close can we get to what we're trying to get? And how far removed are we from the actual goal? Whereas this one is precise, it's, it's consistent, it's repeated, it's very, uh, we're, we're getting kind of the right, not the right result for us, but the, the same result, the consistent result every time in a, in a very clustered way we want. This one, of course, is neither accurate nor precise. And this, of course, is the goal, both accurate and precise. And military technology has improved along both metrics in significant ways by orders of magnitude, orders of magnitude different, not just slightly different in degree, but just over the past 20, 30 years, it's had significant growth along both trajectories. And of course, countless others. And it gets even better than that. There's, there's new emerging and future military technology that goes far beyond this. Uh, think of cyber warfare. Uh, cyber warfare in many ways portends some, some very troubling things that we need to be worried about. Uh, I have some severe ethical worries about some ways that cyber warfare could play out negatively. However, in other ways, some of these new emerging forms of technology could be incredibly good for the principle of distinction and the ability to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants, if used properly. Another uh, aspect of this change in technology in the modern era is that we can have a more fine-grained understanding of our adversary's liability. Now, this is, this is more controversial. Uh, it depends on your view of just war theory and how you think we should think about people's liability in warfare. But because of the increased capabilities of technology, we can know more about our adversaries. So therefore, in theory, we can target those adversaries who actually are morally liable and give those who are actually non-combatants and deserve protection, protection. You could argue, and I have argued at some length, that we could actually take this concept and move beyond the simple binary principle of distinction that's long existed. We actually could be capable of perhaps understanding sub-distinctions within the concept of a combatant or non-combatant that track their moral liability in warfare, not just the very brute distinction, a binary distinction we've had previously. What this would enable would be different kinds of rules of engagement or response options for different categories or population sets. Uh, happy to share some, some work I've had on this. But even if you don't buy this, even if you think that I'm a little out of bounds here and trying to push or even our understanding of distinction, what we can see pretty clearly is that the arc can be reversed and, and I think it is being reversed. In other words, you can argue that technology itself kind of brought us down this really bad trend for civilian harm and warfare because its ability uh, to just do widespread destruction and be indiscriminate, but had to be used and embraced by the powers that be. But then technology itself is also at the same time more recently being that thing that enables us to be ever more discriminate now and enables us actually to employ more restrictive ROEs. And, and, and in fact, pushes us, as I've argued, to actually have a finer grain distinction. Uh, in other words, technology might be the thing that kind of broke the principle uh, in the mechanization and, and aerial bombardment era of the 20th century, but now it's technology itself that might allow for its restoration. Uh, technology gave us this incredible sledgehammer uh, in World War II to carpet bomb entire civilizations, but now technology also through things like drone warfare uh, amongst countless others is perhaps giving us a scalpel. Uh, and in fact, we're going to get even better. I mentioned earlier that payloads are getting smaller. Now you might wonder, well, why does smaller payloads, we can always have smaller payloads. Well, back to the accuracy and precision comment. If we can be incredibly accurate and precise, then we only need a very small payload. If the target of an operation, perhaps in an urban environment, is a combatant, we only need to kill that person or perhaps those two people 
And with a smaller payload, the collateral damage, the, the side effect damage can be radically reduced. Modern swarm drone warfare could take this to a level that we've never even imagined. So the two kind of takeaways here, first is that ethical norms can actually drive technological innovation. And of course, the reverse can also happen. The technological innovation can, can have a tragic output on the ethical behavior that we follow because we can simply use it. Why does this matter? Well, I think actually the future is bright, or I should say brighter. Um, I will say I'm cautiously optimistic for our ability to conduct warfare more ethically, at least in what's known as the use and bellow sphere. That is the, the justification for how we fight in war. And it's an interesting story that how modern technology actually uh, made the prospects for ethical behavior in war greater and greater, uh, more and more dim, uh, uh, worse. But then more recently, modern technology has improved and, and given us more confidence in our ability, if we so choose to use it, to act ethically in war. Of course, I need to stress, none of this matters without the right intentions. And all of our modern warfare could be used for grave evil and significant harm for civilians by anyone, by us or by uh, our adversaries, or our allies. But if the intention and the desire is for a, a collective, a group, a nation state, a military to behave according to the strictures of just war theory, the most modern and recent technological advances we have in military technology actually gives us reasons to be optimistic at our ability to do that. Of course, these kinds of future warfare uh, that I speak of, especially with some of the emerging and future technologies coming down the pipe soon, raise yet new ethical challenges, specifically around use ad bellum, that is the justification for when it is right to use force in the first place and go to war. But I'll have to save those questions for another day. I hope you've uh, enjoyed my talk here. My, I, 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 uh, I'm a borderline, you know, I'm someone who studies just war theory, but uh, some people call me a borderline pacifist and that I think war is generally a pretty terrible thing. But I'm not quite a pacifist. I think that war can be justified. I think that uh, there are times when it's, it's correct morally to enter into warfare as awful as it is. But when we do so, we need to hold ourselves to the highest ideals of striving to fight war as justly as we possibly can. Uh, I'm proud that the US, US military, that we hold ourselves to that just war tradition and strive for that. And of course, the goal is that someday all of the swords in the world can be beaten into plowshares. This is uh, this beautiful uh, sculpture, perhaps you've seen it out front of the UN building in New York, taken from this, this great uh, line of scripture. But until that day comes, sadly, warfare will continue, which means tragically people will die. If we do think that there is a moral reason to give moral distinction to different populations groups within war and protect those who we deem not be liable, then we need to learn how to harness technological advancements in military weaponry to better deliver those results. And I think we can do that. And that's why I'm optimistic uh, for the future of our ethical behavior and warfare through the use of much of our modern technology. Hope you enjoyed that talk. It's a very quick take, just some, some big picture questions around the ethics of warfare and the modern era. Uh, and most recently, even in this awful year of 2020, there's been some really cool developments in, in military technology, which gives us even greater reason for optimism. Thanks again, thanks to the World Affairs Council, and I hope everyone hangs in there as best you can through 2020, and I will see you in 2021. Take care.